Good morning, everyone. Yes, it's Thursday, and here's Pumi Mashiko in the studio. Good morning, Pums. It is a crazy song. How are you? I'm cool. Fantastic. I'm very so, happy that I uh, woke up to be here yeah. today because you thought yesterday was Tuesday. There was almost a very big clash up. I'll tell you that. Really? Um, yeah. Almost a disaster. Oh, well, for me at least, I would. It would have been horrendous for me to not know that I was supposed to wake up to come to the show. I'm very glad you're here. What can I say? <laughs> All right, let's uh, get our morning started. I hope everybody is feeling um, full of the joys of spring and ready to take on the day and blah, 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 because, hell, we got a lot to do. All right, um, where shall we begin? There was a big explosion yesterday. Did you see this? Dude. Oh, what the hell Even that this about? morning when I was, like, reading up, getting ready to come into the show, there's mm-hmm. still lots of unanswered questions. Questions. Questions, yeah, for sure. I mean, so the 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 Nyope mayor, as we've called him, I, it's very unfair, but I mean, that's what we call him. Shame. He has to have a name. Uh, we can't remember who he is. You probably do. Yes. What's his name? Guamanda. <laughs> tap, tap, or something like that. <laughs> you yeah. also have to check. Tap, tap, so, ladies Guamanda. and gentlemen, if Pumi has to check, then we all have to check because there's no way <laughs> the rest of us will remember. But um, yeah, so he's yeah. the he's Guamanda. the mayor of he's the mayor of Johannesburg. So he he actually tweeted for the first time yesterday. Do you want to know what he had to say? Was yesterday the first time he tweeted? First time he said anything to his constituents. I, mean, I suppose that includes us, right? He went to the site. Uh, here he is, but he's wearing a mask, which confuses the hell out of me. I mean, like, what is that for? Is it because he's still afraid of COVID? Is it because he's worried about the air quality in the center of Joburg? In which case, why doesn't he tell everyone else to wear a mask? Maybe all the dust. After All the, the dust. explosion. You think that's what it is? So he said, evening, Joburg. Following the explosion that happened this afternoon in the Joburg CBD, which caused the road to partially collapse, full stop, suddenly. I mean, like, that should be a comma. But anyway, I'll be heading there this evening to assess the damage. Please take note of the following road closures. Brian Simmons, Brian Harrison, and Loveday Street. Oh, Cabelo, not Tabelo. Cabelo Guamanda, the Neope mayor. Anyway, uh... Here he is on site, obviously doing a lot of really useful stuff like politicians always do in a crisis by walking around and distracting the emergency services people so that he can add a photo up. Very important because he tweeted that photo out too. There he is again. But, it, you know, at least he was there. Well, I suppose, you know, we, 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 we let's take you, you small know who victories. Wasn't, you know who wasn't going to miss that photo up? Mm-mm. Is Banyaza Lusufi. Was he there as well? Oh, yes. Oh, of course, yeah. He's Apparently a real media he'll whore. Be addressing. Uh, the issue a little bit later. right, but it is Why kind of in his it? purview. I mean, mm. sort of anything that happens, it's a disaster. You know, like anything that's bad, they love to do. These politicians, they love, they love a funeral. Anything that's miserable, and so they do love a funeral. They love a funeral. They do right, love themselves a funeral. So anyway, uh, that's the the latest news. But I must tell you that 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 explosion was pretty hectic. And um, there's some video going around. If you haven't seen any of this yet, I mean, just take a look at this because it's actually quite extraordinary what's happening there. (laughs) Earthquake in Johannesburg on Bree Street. Wow, guys, people are hurt. What the fuck? Look at that car. Ha, 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 ha. The whole street, literally. Ha 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 ha! Look at that quantum over there. Ha 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 ha! Guys. Ha 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 ha! Anyway, that's a, our star reporter on the scene. Look at this fucking thing. She says, "I mean, she thought an earthquake. So did I when I saw that. But apparently, a gas explosion under the road. Uh, Egoli Gas are claiming it's not them." Which but I mean, then suggests that it's probably Zamazamas. But Pumi, that is some serious damage. That is yeah. very serious damage. And I don't know how long it's going to take them to repair that because, I mean, they still haven't fixed those barriers on Catherine Street that we were talking about just the other day. So I don't hold out much hope for, you know, the Bree Street. That And that's, look, luckily our CBD is such a toilet anyway that, you know, we don't really think about it very much. But so that is... Just across from the, the all the train tracks, yeah, from uh, Bramfontein. That's right. 
has Bhagavantu sent us eyewitness reports. Uh, well, he lives here now, so he hardly he, his, oh, his uh, offices are, are, are near there, but he doesn't uh, he doesn't live in that area anymore. So we'll have to we'll have to find out from him. But I mean, it's quite a serious thing. <clears throat> and Simpiwe couldn't help herself. She made a "Hey, you can't park there." No video, which is hilarious. Oh dear! <laughs> but that is very very serious. Mm. I mm, often drive problem. on just the other side. What's the new name of that? Oh, what used to be Harrow Road, on the other side towards um, City what, what, Deep. Oh yeah, when you go through like past Yeovil and past Ponty. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then <clears throat> just on the other side, what you can see. On the M2, so yes. it's the M2 on the l- south side mm-hmm. of the M2, is you do see quite a lot of Zama Zamas, right? So yeah. all this illegal mining. And every time I drive past there, I'm always asking myself why there is no policing, no, why this, is this... not being stopped, What what is going to happen with all... And it's open, no, and they, uh, Donald Trump. Donald Trump called us a shithole country. He called a bunch of countries shithole countries, and we're living up to his and, expectations. And if Ecole Gas is saying this is not them, then it must be Zama Zamas, as you say, mm. undermining, literally undermining the city, which is what they're doing. So, hmm. if that's the case, uh, then I think maybe it's about time that the government and the police took these people seriously, because they're causing proper danger and damage. I mean. I don't know how many this people. This is just two weeks after the last gas uh, explosion in Boxburg. That's right. There were well, yeah, there've been a few. Remember, there was also that tanker that drove under no, the bridge. No, but the one I'm talking about is particularly linked to uh, illegal mining and mm. illegal refining of gold. Jesus. That's what that explosion was. About. It's because they need the the, the 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 acetylene, and they need essentially to to heat up these sediments which then releases the gold at its melting point, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. What a mess. Anyway, uh, a couple of comments on this. Um, there are lots of people talking about it, actually. It's going to take them 15 years, eight corrupt tenders and a commission inquiry to fix this. I think we should just, you know, do this to the whole of the Joburg CBD. Just just completely, like, let the whole thing just sink into the ground because it's such a disaster. No. no, it's such an ugly. I mean, Ben was on last week talking about how he goes on these tours of the inner city and there's so many beautiful buildings, but it's a derelict place. And I appreciate all the work that so many people put in over the past couple of years, trying to rehabilitate the CBD, but it is a disaster. You look at those pictures, you look at that video. That's not a city I could be proud of. I will stay the hell out of the CBD from now on. I have no interest in going there anymore. And I'm sure I'm not the only one, right? I still go to the CBD quite often. Well, That's you're going to fall I into a hole. You're going you know, to disappear into some crater and we'll never see you again. That looks like the kind of stuff you see in an action sense. movie where LA gets hit by a major earthquake and the tectonic plates separate and California breaks off from the mainland. You know those movies? That is, That's what it looks like. That is quite a hectic. So uh, I'm not going there. Thank you very much. Joburg is now a world-class toilet city. And uh, our Neopi mayor can go and look at, at, at the damage as much as he wants. I have no faith he'll fix anything. So I'm sorry if I sound very cynical about this, but I've seen the rest of the city, which is not in that state, and there's no one doing anything to try and fix that. So I'm, I'm going to be a little bit more cynical than usual on the Johannesburg front this morning. <laughs> Cheers, everybody. Don't pay your taxes. Yeah. That's my, that's my thought. Is... And the cops don't do anything about those zamazamas. Because obviously they're on the take as well, right? <clears throat> and and the Zamazamas aren't going like 80 in a 60 zone. So that's not a reason to arrest them. And they're underground, so they can't see them all the time. Yeah, that's it's right? very hectic down there. That's all I Anyway. Post-apocalyptic. Um, <clears throat> post-apocalyptic. It is. Today it's I horrible. am having, my tongue is a little bit tired. Because I couldn't say questions earlier. Now I just tried to read apocalyptic. <laughs> well. Uh, let's just change tack for a second because I've got something really, really stupid to tell you about. Okay, this, uh, this is going to irritate you a little bit. Oh. Um, two things that are a little bit upsetting about what's going on in modern culture, and I think it's worth reflecting on these things. So the first one is, this is at a, a, a concert somewhere in America. Miranda Lambert, I've never heard of her. Have you? Yeah. Apparently some kind of singer. But then they're a dime a dozen. 
uh, you know, one thing the world what doesn't What type need. of singer? Who what knows? genre? Who okay. knows? She looks like she could be maybe a country singer or something. Anyway, she calls out fans who took a selfie mid-song. So she probably said to them, and I don't know oh, for sure. I did see this. But she probably said something like, hey, guys, wouldn't it be great if you were living in the moment, enjoying the song with me? You're here right now. I love you. You love me. I'm pretty sure this is the kind of bullshit that people talk on a stage at a concert, right? And she probably said something like, why don't you not use your phone and actually just enjoy what you have? You paid for this. Mm -hmm. Anyway, some concert goers decided to leave the show following the incident. This is now called an incident because the singer on the stage who they've paid to come and see told them, hey, why don't you get off your phone? I would have done it in a much, a much less uh, friendly way. I would have been like, get off your fucking phone. But she didn't. And I'll tell you what, she's well within her rights to tell people, hey, why don't you pay attention to what you paid the ticket price to, to come and see? Well, yeah, you're here for this. Let's do the song together. Why don't you sing with me? Why don't you look? I w I've been to a number of concerts in my time. Okay. And I, I'm a few. Yeah, I've been to a few. It has never struck me as a brilliant idea to take out my phone and to take a picture of me with the concert going on in the background at any stage. And if anyone finds such a photo, I will have myself branded a hypocrite. So go ahead and look. But also, do you really think your photography from 20 people deep or 50 people deep in the audience of the stage with a tiny little picture of the artist who's diminutive on your excellent camera that can only see probably in that sort of light? about 20 meters ahead of it. Do you really think that photo is going to be one that you're going to treasure? Do you blow up and stick in a frame on your wall? Well, maybe they're not going to blow it up and stick it on their wall, but tomorrow they'll tell, look where I was. <laughs> well, <clears throat> she did this. Now, they call this an incident, which is bizarre. This is a Good Morning America reporting, so I don't expect very much from them. But it's an incident, first of all. And second of all, can I just ask anyone who's listening to us this morning, is that not a reasonable thing to ask an audience to do at a concert. And is she so out of line that these people, they need their phones so badly that they'll leave the concert? Because that's what they say here. Some concert goers decided to leave the show. In other words, these children were reprimanded and decided, well, then we're just not going to be at your show anymore. These children. That's what happened here. Well, I'm glad for them. I'm glad they decided it's, it's not what I want to leave. Not for left. me, right? Which I always think that's that's what you do, right? If Fair you're enough. In a, instead of right. irritating everybody else around you, All right? So these people them. really don't want to be told to put their phones away because their phone is their only connection <laughs> to anything. They have become so dependent on their phones, these phones, right? I mean, what kind of hope is there for? If we had an electro electromagnetic pulse suddenly, let's say the sun decided to have a solar flare that was sufficient enough to cause a cosmic storm, which would head straight to Earth and knock out all of our comms for up oh, potentially weeks. It would take weeks to restore some of that, perhaps even months. I think there would be a new form of mental illness. They would, and it people would, would actually have meltdowns. They would. They would. I, they'd completely lose it. They wouldn't know how to communicate. They wouldn't know how to arrange anything with anyone. In these days, poor Ryan, God bless him, but it's happened enough that we, uh, you know, one of us is late or one of us doesn't wake up. It's happened to all of us, right? But he checks in with me like three times before I even get <laughs> to the studio. And he has to, he's doing his job. But most people can't even go to a lunch with a friend without confirming with them eight times on the phone and then telling them, where are you sitting? I mean, before you'd have to walk in and maybe look around the restaurant a little bit. But people can't do this. You can't go to a concert without filming yourself. Do you remember there was a time when we actually remembered people's numbers? Remember people's numbers. We remember their addresses. We could, <laughs> we could navigate somewhere without the phone. I'm telling you, I don't think these yeah, but things... but you needed a, a map book. You needed, sometimes you needed a map book. Because sometimes you could remember where someone was if you'd been there once before. Or you could yeah, follow yeah, yeah. directions. You remember directions? Like, turn left at the Spaza <laughs> shop. Right? Remember that? Three streets down. I've been to your parents. I've been to your parents' house once in Soweto. I'm pretty much sure I can find it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? Look, but if you've been once, you don't need ways so, all the time. I don't want to sound like a grumpy old man about this, but I think I'm on Miranda, whatever her face's name is. 
Somebody said um, here she's a very famous country singer. Okay, well. And I just want to say, we only recognize Dolly Parton as famous country singers. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, listen, I, I really just think, uh, Carl's right, the photo is not for printing, and you said this already, Pumi, it's for social cachet, attention whores. It's just so sad that people have forgotten how to enjoy anything without making it about them. Everything has to be about me, 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 the whole time. It's very sad. And they must have been close enough to the front for her to be able to have seen them from yeah. the stage. Yeah. Shame. It's terrible, right? I just think I feel so sorry for these people that this is the reason. And then they have a tantrum and storm out of the concert, <laughs> which they've paid for. I mean, I'd leave the concert if it was shit, but to pay your ticket price and then leave. So that's one thing that's really stupid. And let me show you something else that's really stupid. I'm not going to put any pictures is up here. Do you know who B.B. Rexa is? Here's another person we don't know. Okay, so B.B. Rexa is apparently some kind of singer as well. That's why I say they're a dime a dozen. Anyway, she's broken up with her boyfriend. Apparently her boyfriend, according to her now, and then I'll give you the actual message because she's stupid enough to share her <laughs> private messages with her boyfriend. So I know a lot of people don't care about B.B. Rex, and frankly, neither do I. But listen to them. There's a lesson in this. I think there's something for us to learn. There's something for us to glean about modern culture and about particularly the, 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 the self-absorbed nonsense that goes on in society that we often bring up on the show. All right, so B.B. Rexer breaks up with her boyfriend, and she says it's because he called her fat. Okay? So here's the actual message which she puts up on Twitter. I mean, I can put it up for you. Oh, my gosh. She <clears throat> put it on Twitter. Oh so you can see it's for real. She puts this on Twitter. I'll read it out to you because the print's going to be too small. But um, you tell me if this guy, this, this ex-boyfriend of hers, sounds like a really mean, chauvinistic, nasty... Um, Body shaming son of a bitch. All right, here it is. Listen to this. Hey, and by the way, what kind of person puts their private message from their boyfriend on the internet for everybody to see? What kind of attention seeking nonsense is this? So now, any guy who ever dates BB Rexa needs to know she's probably going to end up putting those messages out there for everyone to see. That should make you feel really good about yourself if you're a boyfriend. Anyway, he goes, Hey, I never said you weren't beautiful, and I never said I didn't love you. In fact, I said how beautiful you are and how much I loved you. But I always said I would be honest with you, and your face was changing, so I told you it was. That was the conversation we were having, and you asked. Because I care, would you rather I lied to you? You gained 35 pounds. Obviously, you gained weight, and your face changes. Should I just pretend it didn't happen and that it's okay? Come on, I gained three pounds and you call me chubs and fat. Doesn't mean you don't love me. If you're trying to find reasons to break up, this makes sense. But it's not the real reason. If you're unhappy with me, yourself, life, and don't see a future with us, then that's okay. And that's the reason. Don't use something like that to weaponize your anger or anxiety or any insecurity you may have. You know I always found you to be beautiful. And I loved you no matter what. I think it's important for you to think about things and write things down. Speak to a therapist and do this retreat thing to get to the root of the problem. Let me know if you'd like to speak if you need more clarity. Love you. So is this the message the boyfriend That's wrote? That's what the boyfriend sent her. Shame, man. So much clarity. So what's going on here? If you were a woman and you were dating a guy and you asked him, do I look fat in this dress? And he sent you a message like that. And that was the reason you broke up with him. What's going, what do you think's going on here? Give it to me from a woman's perspective. And then I'll try and explain how, <laughs> how a guy thinks. I'll try to explain. <laughs> try it. Please, Pumi, help me understand this. You're the most sensible person I know. Go on. This is, she just wants to break up with him. Mm -hmm. She just wants to break up with him. Any excuse will do, an right? Extra, she needed <clears> an excuse. <throat> Maybe she really is unhappy. She's unhappy with him. She's unhappy with... Most of these singers are unhappy. The, Most of these Hollywood celebrities are unhappy. And I wonder about that too. Doesn't that also make you ask a few questions? Why do these people have really, all this money, all this fame, all of this attention from strangers? Why are they so unhappy? Because she's, she's definitely an unhappy person. Why would you share a private so conversation? I just like, looked up who she is mm. because I've never seen this face even. Sure. Which is... 
amazing for a person who consumes as much media as I do. Never heard of her. <laughs> Neither have I. <laughs> I got to tell you, I mean, she's very famous. She's got millions of followers on social media. Yeah, she's written songs for with she's, with she's, Eminem and Selena Gomez. And she's Nick not an Jonas. unattractive woman by any stretch of the imagination. I can only imagine she's been tremendously successful, and I I wish her well. But there is a very serious problem here. If anybody in the audience would like to explain what they think is going on here, because no. I'm confused. I'm very I'm seriously confused. If I this is definitely an <clears throat> SMS that could have been a phone call. But if I sent a message like that after I was accused, because she obviously, she doesn't show the messages that she sent him, oh. right? She doesn't show those. But she says, he broke up with me because I'm fat. This is BB Rexa, by the way. That's what she looks like. Um, if I'd sent a message like he sent her here, I think that would be me being as kind, considerate, loving, caring as it is almost possible to be. He's very sweet. That message right? is very sweet. Isn't this he, the most lovely very, guy? Don't, don't you want to meet him? He's very considered. What it's, a great it's guy. He's not angry. It's no. not. And he's just like, mm, okay, I get it. And he's like, if you want to break but up I with me, that's fine. Were, I think know. she wants to break up with him. Well, then she should learn to fucking say it. I'm so sick of people who just can't talk properly about what they want. <laughs> and then when they don't get what they want, they blame someone else. Right? I think today you need a wusa moment. No, no, no. But There's isn't so it... many things upsetting you. It's, it's not really upsetting me. <laughs> I, I look at the, Please, I'm so dispassionate about this. You have no idea. If I sound like I'm annoyed by it, I am. Annoyed. But, That's the but I'm, not, I'm not personally involved in this situation at all. I just think that this is precisely where men and women's communication goes down the toilet. And I know so many relationships wonder... that don't involve me where similar things have happened. Where the husband and wife or the boyfriend and girlfriend... They have conversations, but the girl doesn't actually say what she means and she doesn't tell you what she wants. And then the guy is like, but I thought we'd, we'd spoken about this and we'd agreed. And then she goes, but it's not how I feel. And then everything deteriorates. And you end up with uh, broken homes and broken hearts. Why? But it's not about what it's about. So what is it then? Yeah, I don't know. What, She's what? maybe been unhappy for other things, and this is a it's a good spark. It's a well, good spark for it to be the this is this is it this is the end. Richard says. Richard Banda says. Gee, we live in a generation where we don't keep our private lives private. She wants people to feel sorry for her. She wants her fans to cry in her corner. That's a very interesting observation, and I think you might be onto something because that has become a thing, right? Mm. People want. Um, Strangers to join them in a pity party. It's a good one. Uh, Carl says, the only thing you never lie about in a relationship is how food tastes because you'll get bad food again. Do I look fat in this? No. The answer is always no. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Bella Donna says, interesting story. I'm glad she or he put their stuff out there for us to explore. <laughs> <laughs> Shame. He was so gentle, says famous mama. So straightforward. He, that is, I mean, that, SMS is a very well thought through set of words, you know, it's, and every part of it, none of it is emotional. It's all very, it's very considered it's very and thoughtful, like, actually. Sounds like a person who's been through therapy. But someone who's also in touch with their own emotions. Yeah. Like sounds emotionally like mature. Who's been yeah. Through therapy. So again, this is another thing. People say they value truth. People, everyone you meet will say to you, you know what I really want in a partner is honesty. Nobody values the truth. People don't want to hear the truth. That's a, now there's an interesting observation too. People don't want to hear BB, the truth. Because BB Rex is not like the dumbest one among us. She may be right up there and dumb, <laughs> but she's not the dumbest person on earth, right? And her behavior here is not so foreign to those of us who've been in similar situations. It's not. <laughs> We've all seen this. And it's not just a guy-girl thing because some guys also have no relationship with the truth. Most people don't want to hear the truth. They want to hear something that will comfort them. And usually the truth is not the thing that's going to comfort you. Well, if they don't realize that what they want is something to comfort them, then when they get the truth, they have only themselves to blame. <laughs> Here endeth the lesson. I'm, I just I knew I needed to bring this to you because you're the only one who actually have a point of view on this. All right, uh, Putin will not attend the BRICS summit, so there'll be no need for Alan Windy to rush up to him with a pair of handcuffs and 
bravely put them on Putin's <laughs> hands. I mean, can you imagine? And I uh, yesterday I saw, I know we're going to save some of this for the burning platform. This sort of stuff puts me so off John Steenhuisen and the DA. And I like what they're doing and they manage things well, but they must just manage things. I don't want to hear thought leadership from any of those people. In fact, all I'd like politicians to do is just be good at fixing things. That would be great. Yeah. So he had things to say about Putin and the BRICS summit yesterday. I didn't watch any of it. It just came up on my feed. And I was like, dude, do you really think that all those people in Bree Street who are living in a post-apocalyptic nightmare right now, taxis that have fallen down into chasms, underground explosions that probably killed the Zamazamas, if you're right, Pumi, and your theory is correct. People who are now unable to find access to their workplace because these streets are going to be closed. Buildings and that might that need a, to be condemned. It, it, you know, because that's you know? a big transport node <sighs> on the street. But imagine that's now, a lot imagine of what this means. get to and from work. Imagine what this means for the buildings down that street too. So many of them will have to be condemned. They're probably unstable. Some of them are probably going to collapse in the next few weeks. If that happened down the road, it can happen under the buildings. We just don't see it. Mm -hmm. And what's John Steenhuisen talking about? Vladimir Putin and the Ukraine war. Please get off. Well, they had to claim cross. the victory. They Ugh. had to claim the victory. They didn't win anything. So here's what happened. Let's give you the real story. Russia's president will not attend a summit in South Africa next month. The announcement comes after South Africa's leader said any attempt to arrest him would be a declaration of war against Russia. If Mr. Putin had left Russian soil, he would have been subject to an international criminal court arrest warrant. But we have no record for doing anything that international criminal court wants us to do. We didn't do it with Omar al-Bashir when he came here. So why would we suddenly do it with Vladimir Putin? Well, except for the fact that this whole thing is politicking of the highest accord, right? That was not a tongue, that was not a, 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 a mispronunciation. No, that Poli is not a mis Politricking is a great word. Only Pumi and very, very smart people I know use that. That is definitely not a slight of the tongue mm -hmm. because we all know, including the criminal court, yeah. right? They know yep. that traveling on a diplomatic passport gives you certain immunities. Yep. And this is what Vladimir Putin would be traveling on. Correct. If the ICC indeed did want to arrest Vladimir Putin, when they issued that warrant, they could have gone. They could have gone and to got his him. office. Go and get him. And got him there. But they're big windbags, like Alan to, Windy. To make it to to <laughs> to kind of lay it on. And this is what happens when you have such weak leadership, right? And for weeks. Is it weeks? Months now, yeah. right? Russia's also been playing this baiting game because everybody in this value chain knows what it is, what kind of protections you have with diplomatic passports, mm -hmm. what countries can and cannot do, yeah. particularly with heads of states. Right. <laughs> but this is where we are, all those well, games that had to be played. Russia's going to send Sergei Lavrov, who is the foreign minister, for the two-day summit instead. Now, I mean, they could easily arrest him because that won't get headlines. Mm. You know, you could go up to Sergei Lavrov and try to arrest him. He's part of the government of Russia. Uh, but again, as far as I know, the criminal court doesn't like him very immunities. much. But this is how it works, right? These people don't know how it works. These are supposed politicians and they're grandstanding. I think they do know how it works. This is just grandstanding. This is what grandstanding is about. Well, um, apparently... Uh, the BRICS summit will take place. Russia's going to send him everything. Well, will there's proceed. been lots of kind of bilaterals happening around the BRICS summit, as we would, as many of you would have seen a couple of days ago. Even Figile Mbalula and his selfies, because mm -hmm. he was hosting um, <laughs> a number of the executives, senior members of Frilimo. All right. We're also That's here. still and a it's thing, huh? For Limo, still a thing. What are you talking about? They're the, they're, they're, they're the they're governors the govern of Angola. They're the governing party. <laughs> so all of these individuals keep coming here. There was there was a couple of weeks ago, the education ministers of a whole lot of the BRICS countries were here. And they were hosted by our uh, Miss Edgy. So there, there's a, a whole lot of 
other parts of this conference that have been happening over the past couple of months. But none of them are as exciting as talking about arresting Vladimir yep. Putin. Yeah, get get some attention. But it's it's just bizarre. I mean, I don't know. Guess Jack Nicholson was right when all those years ago said, you can't handle the truth, Sanele. <laughs> you know, that was in, what a great movie. You know, I watched that again the other day. Well, not the other day, it's a couple of months ago now. But A Few Good Men, what a terrific movie. Those lines that he, when, when he and Tom Cruise are in that courtroom and he goes, are we clear? He goes, Crystal. <laughs> and then he gets up to go. And Tom Cruise goes, I haven't dismissed you. Oh. And then he says, you got to call me Colonel. I think I've earned it. <laughs> and then the judge of the court, he says, I don't know what kind of operation you're running here. And the judge goes, you call this, the, you will address the court properly. I think I've earned it. <laughs> oh. that Some good shit is there. great on so many levels. Love it. Love it. Um, any, any guess? Because I joked with Fresh on Tuesday uh, that, where is the president? No, he has no theories. He thinks he's just sitting at home on gardening leave. Well, right, the president. Because, I mean, this, this statement about how he will not be arrested, that's Vladimir Putin, came from the president. We haven't seen him. Who last saw him? He, he, what, he was speaking at the gala dinner with Frilimo on Tuesday night. Oh, is he there as well? <laughs> was that in, in Angolo here? Yeah. Yeah. Where, where did they have? This is important, obviously. It, in Pretoria, what is that Jesus. hotel that they always have those the things? The Hilton. Not the Hilton. The, the, um, St. George's uh, Hotel. St. George's Hotel. Oh, is that where they had it? Oh, okay. <laughs> That's in Centurion. Jesus. St. George's Hotel. Oh, my God. He was speaking at that gala dinner, and he was, well, he's been actually quite out and about. He was at the thing that they had for um, Jesse Duarte last week oh they're, they're, they're doing memorial dinners because they remember i brought you pictures last week of another <laughs> memorial dinner <that> they <laughs> had for Ronnie Momwepa. <laughs> gee these anc people are definitely oh no wait he was also at the unveiling of oh. not one but two nelson mandela's statues. yes oh this is a big story actually so I, I i stumbled across this by mistake and then read a very bad summary of the headline on tuesday because it was mandela day Apparently, two Mandela statues unveiled in the Eastern Cape leave a bitter taste as Durban prepares to unveil another one at a 22 million rand cost to the taxpayer. So this is how our government, ladies and gentlemen, rewards us uh, for a country they've run into the ground. They put up statues that we didn't ask for, that nobody cares about, as virtue signaling. Here we go. Statues unveiled in you know Tata and Kurnu. Really what was really bad about that is Anele Mdota's father, mm. um, who's a well-known uh, business person in that Eastern Cape. Yep. He unveiled also on Tuesday a, a what do they ECD center, early development yeah, early center. Early childhood, like, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He built a school on the grounds of the, the school th that he went, you know, right. so all those many years ago. So he's upgraded the center and it is an incredibly beautiful, like primary school. I think it's got the first three years of foundation phase or something like that right. with the computer center and just really beautiful. And of course, Anele was blasting this on her mm. Twitter, all of the stuff. Well, I think it's praiseworthy. Right? Yeah. And here is a business person, an individual, Private individual. with his own money. <clears throat> doing what the government should be doing. And instead they put up statues. And instead, at the same time, in the same Can I just ask you, let me just ask you quickly. The government is unveiling statues that they've uh, yeah. spent millions on. Well, the, we've, they've spent our millions on. Why would a statue cost 22 million rand? I do not know an artist in this country who's so good that they would be paid 22 million rand for a statue. I, I don't know. Why, why would a statue cost that much? Who else is on the take here? <laughs> Did it cost 22 well, million that's the one rand? In, that's the one in Durban we haven't even seen yet. Oh, my God. I don't know how much the two in uh, Umtata and Do you think they Kuru. just diverted? And by the way, Tata Do you think they Kuru diverted not... the, the flag? The budget that Probably. Nazi went to? Split it into three statues. Jesus. Um <laughs> The, the, the Ntata and 
Kapunu are two of the worst run municipalities in the country. They're definitely bankrupt. They definitely aren't providing services to the people who live there, but put up statues. These people are actually just making a complete mockery of us now. Now they're not even trying to hide the ball. You know? Listen. Unreal. This is a, I think. I say this, by the way, as a fan a of thing. Nelson Mandela, and we've, we've got some nice statues of him up, which he deserves to have. But Jesus, yeah, do we, we need two need more? That many. Three more? Really? Just unbelievable. I think um, I think this is a big, big problem, and I, I'm glad you brought it up. But well done to Anela's dad for um, for actually doing something that we do need yeah. in this country. Thank you. And um, that was, I think, that was a definitely a a lose. Yeah, for hundred percent. And it makes them look bad. That probably wasn't his intention. But and they don't uh, need any more things to make them look bad. But so it's I, good. I was talking yesterday about the. Um, the conspicuous consumption of Floyd Mayweather in Santon, which may or may not have been true. But listen to this, because I think... As, Is this as, the millions he spent at Gucci? Well, we, again, we don't know if that's true or not, but we spoke about that at length <laughs> yesterday, and there were some interesting discussions around it. I do want to refer to this quickly. And as South Africans, as ordinary citizens, we should not... We certainly shouldn't celebrate this kind of thing. But I think we must almost make it socially unacceptable for people to behave like this. A 273,000 rand restaurant bill for one person has left people on Twitter shocked. But then they're always shocked. I do think this is shocking. Um, Kais Tolle, who we know, posted the bill. Um, he said that the items on the bill included a bottle of Armand Ace of Spade gold champagne, which costs 105,000 rand. A bottle of Hennessy Paradis for 30, 32,000 rand and three bottles of Dom Perignon, each set the person back 24,000 rand. While these are merely the items on the hefty bill that mainly consists of booze, there are other parts of the bill that are even more mind-blowing. First up is the fact that the bill indicates it only covers one person. The other is that the person served was served between midnight and 5 a.m., on a Monday morning. I saw that. So, your top line takeaways from this. I actually had to look at the date because I wondered if this... Because it was... I think he posted it on Monday, mm. which was the 17th. Mm -hmm. So, I was asking myself, is this like last year's bill? And I wondered if it was photoshopped. Because always when I see those kind of you, slips... You, you can't believe it, right? Because it's unbelievable. It's money laundering. So why do we allow it? Why does this kind of thing happen? Like, why do Zama Zamas get to where's dig that, under the roads and undermine SARS the city? Unit? Where's the SARS unit? <laughs> we must ask Edward Kisveta. Where's that SARS unit that is kind of going, hmm. Let me just tell you, 273,000 rand. Pull me, you, you know, you can buy a lot for 273,000 rand. Someone, oh, wow. someone who's prepared to spend that on essentially a couple of bottles of booze. 273,000 rand is probably a quarter of my year. This is the kind of mm. expenses that would be at least three months. And this includes food for a teenager oh. and school fees. I, I, I would say probably for most people, four, five, six months. But, but for these people, it's one night out. On a, mon on a Monday... I've got to point out, this is not a serious person because it means they didn't do any work on the Tuesday. Listen here, that is money laundering. Sure. The, the thing, and this is also one of the things that Kaya pointed out on his tweet, is that the, the phone number of the restaurant, it, which is why I thought maybe it was photoshopped, is it's not the whole phone number. Like at the top of the slip, you know, where they have the address, the oh, name yeah. and the phone number. The phone number is not completely there and then you're just like mm. do we know what restaurant it was i think coffee oh, so I think, yeah. Yeah. well I, I think they should be embarrassed someone should be going in there and checking out that their, their their cash register sars uh if you're listening it's time for you to start That's doing what, what you're I there for doing if i was a diligent public service at servant <clears throat> yeah. at sars i'd be wondering i wonder what the tax returns of this particular restaurant yeah and let's go and see what's in their just, fridge. 
Let's and let's go look. and see, and let's go and look at their guest list, and let's see who the last few book tables were and how much they spent, and then we go and do, we go and do some, that much we go and do some lifestyle audits on those people on a Monday night in five midnight. hours. Yeah. That is very expensive. P. Is this in Joburg or Pretoria? It's in Pretoria. That's the same restaurant that had that huge bill last year. Yeah, so definitely money laundering. So someone needs to go and sort that out. Right? Um, we should be publicly ridiculing and cajoling every single MP uh, and their kids and extended family. It's time to cancel the corrupt. Well, again, yes. I mean, as ordinary citizens, we should not look upon these people, people with anything but disdain. We should make it very difficult for them to go out and thumb their noses at us like this. It's one thing for Floyd Mayweather to come and spend his US dollars here on luxury items, whether he did or didn't. But it's entirely a different thing if these are people who are spending essentially laundered tax money. Mm. That's a disgrace. So I, I think we need answers. And I think that who Edward Kisvetter needs to, to be the person who answers these questions. Who are these people? Who are these people? How do they get to spend all this money? All How right, well. Make all this money. I'm sorry, Pums. I mean, if this is all uh, grumpy stuff for a Thursday morning, I had to have at least one day this week where I was grumpy and there's enough to cover. So Ches says, it's the artist who made the Mandela statue for 22 million rand. who had to celebrate his statue <laughs> being unveiled on a Monday morning. <laughs> ah, it's just unbelievable, right? Check out their bar and you will see that they probably only stock black label, says Tyrant. <laughs> In which case, they're charging for things that they're not actually selling. Does anyone know if there are plans to build a new coal power station, says Richard? Of course not. Hey, what about a just transition? What Building about new coal how, power stations? How about, you remember I brought those questions in last week for the burning platform about how many new schools have been built, how many new hospitals, how many new universities, how many roads have been fixed. We'll never get those figures hmm. because all that money is now just basically, if you are a taxpayer in this country, you're actually an accessory to a crime. <laughs> So we need to think morally. I'm being very serious here. And I, you know, I will leave this alone after this because it dawns on me more and more when I see the state of this country. And I think as a taxpayer, you have to morally distance yourself from the criminality that's happening here. And, and one of the ways to do that is to say, I actually shouldn't be paying tax because I know for a fact there is now more than enough evidence and none of it is circumstantial. There are actual money trails. You can trace this stuff digitally now. We can see that this money is being stolen and is being used by criminal people to do things like 250,000 rand restaurant bills. If you, Bar bills. By paying your tax, you know how they used to say, pay your TV license, it's the right thing to do. Remember? <laughs> Have they stopped saying that? I don't know. But you know what's the right thing to do? Stop paying your taxes. Honest to God. It is actually morally unconscionable for you to be feeding this beast. First of all, a lot of the taxes that we have paid over the last 10 years have gone to Dubai in the Gupta's pockets. And that which has remained has been pilfered by all the small petty thieves in our government. And by petty, I mean people who've still taken substantial amounts of money. Just by comparison with the Gupta's, not that much. It is now, it is a moral obligation for every South African to stop paying this government our taxes. Honest to God. Uh, I know that sounds like treason, and it probably is, but it's worth saying. Yeah, there's a lot we can still do. Yeah, I hope so. Um, no new statues, just a shambok in every household, says Congo. Chris, <laughs> vote shambok party 2024. Chris, <laughs> Chris is convinced that shamboks will solve our problems. <laughs> All right. Here's something funny and ridiculous for you. Uh, I got this from somebody on social media. $75 for a lightly shat office chair <gasps> in, um, <laughs> in Australia. <laughs> a lightly... <laughs> if you have uh, 75 Australian dollars that you'd like to spend, you can get a lightly shat office chair. <laughs> That's what they actually put on the tag. How much rent is 75 <sighs> Australian uh, dollars. I don't know, but it's a lot for a lightly shat office chair. I'm sure you could get an unshat. You could get an unshat chair for probably a little bit less. 
I'm pretty sure in most places, right? <laughs> What is the life? What is the lifespan of a, an office chair? Because we've had these chairs for a long time, and they're still in very good condition. Remember, we got them from Cloud Chairs all those years ago. Listen here, it's a thousand three hundred and forty-one. That's a lot months. for a lightly shat <laughs> office chair. That's a lot. <laughs> no, this, is this, no, no, U.S. dollars, Australian dollars. Um, I was looking for a heavily shat one, but I'll take what I can get. <laughs> says <laughs> Virus. <laughs> Okay, it's only 912. Oh, only. Still too much for that. Right? <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, how about this then? This is an amazing story. Okay, so this picture, what do you think this is, apart from just another gross piece of medieval art? What does it look like? Just describe this to people who are listening. In, in a Francie. really dear friend holding back the hair <laughs> of a slightly, possibly a friend <laughs> who spent that bar bill that we just spoke right. about and is now having a sick moment. Yeah, he's, he's, a guy, it's a guy throwing up and, and the woman is holding back his hair. And, and in the background... How do you know it's a guy? I'll explain why now. Because it, it actually isn't like a drunken night out. I'll explain what this is. And then I also want to have your opinion on this book. I'm, <laughs> I'm seeking your wisdom on a lot of stuff this morning. So that picture refers to the following story. There was a French city where during the Middle Ages, the women had a strange habit. In the morning, married women would put a small dose of poison in the breakfast they'd prepared for their husbands. Later on, when the men returned home in the evening, they'd be given an antidote. In this way, the poison <laughs> in this way the poison would not become harmful or affect them. There was a strict reason for this practice. Should the husbands remain elsewhere for too long, as the administration of the antidote was delayed, the men would end up experiencing symptoms like nausea, headaches, depression, vomiting, pain, shortness of breath. <laughs> the longer the men delayed in returning to their wife and home, the sicker they would get. Ultimately, when they returned home, the wife unknowingly gave him the antidote. In this way, within a few minutes, he quickly started feeling better. All of this worked as a trick, giving men the impression that being away from home would lead to pain and depression. Therefore, the husbands would be more attached to their homes and their wives. Oh, my God. That what is a lot of work to keep a man. What do we say? <laughs> What do we say to this practice that you see? That is a lot of work to keep a man. <clears throat> is it worth it? And but, and by the sounds of it, they don't want to really be kept. Because if they have to feel sick, if they <laughs> therefore they come back. It's unbelievable, oh, right? God, it's ridiculous. Isn't that ridiculous? But it actually happened. That's a true story. Fuck. Can you imagine? Also, imagine being these these terrible women in this town. I mean, yes. first of all, first of all, to go to these lengths, as you say, it's a lot of work to keep a man. To go to these lengths, you have to be a little bit of a psychopath yourself. And you, you must really want these men. And you must have no other means of keeping them around, right? I mean, poisoning them and then giving them an antidote. Poison them a little. Just a little, yeah. I just, th I think this is absolutely un unbelievable. Oh, but it apparently ridiculous. actually happened. Oh, man. What I would love to know is the women's conference that came to the conclusion this was that a, this is how this we're going to deal with this. Imagine those women. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> you imagine them? A bunch of <laughs> witches getting together. And, okay, and the, ladies, listen to what I've got a plan. Imagine the woman who suggested it. She's like, <laughs> got this little, yeah, I got a little vial of stuff How here. long did this practice I continue? I don't know. They must have put a stop to but it. But also, some point. every subsequent year, when the new, at, at which point, of kind of like new bride life, do you get your little vial of poison? Yeah, the, the and who old, gives it to the, you? The older women in the village come to you and go, "Hi." But who is it? We who gives you've... it to you? Is it your mother-in-law or is it your own mother? Uh huh. Jeez, there's so much. Uh huh. Right. It's <laughs> ridiculous. I don't know. Uh, here's uh, Richard Bunda says, "Yes, sis. After God, fear women." <laughs> 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 well, again, nobody likes the truth, right? You don't want the truth. Instead, we want to be comforted. Mm. You said it yourself. The husband will come back, be like, I felt so terrible until I saw you, my darling. And she'll go, oh, yeah, yeah. 
yeah, hold, yeah. Let me hold back your hair. Yeah. Here's a cup of coffee <laughs> it's just, for you. It's sh- Let's it's see most, if this helps. It's unadulterated hatred. That's what that is. There's no other way to put it. There's no honesty in that relationship. I wonder how many people are driving to work this morning, starting their day, dropping the kids off, oh, brushing their terrible. teeth, whatever it is you're doing, and you're thinking, I wonder if my wife or husband would do that to me. If that thought comes to your head, <laughs> it's time I to think go. you, like BB, what's BB Rexton? How do you say her name? BB Rexa. Like BB Rexa, might need to consider that this is the end of the road maybe for you, that yeah, relationship. Just, maybe you should be honest with yourself, you know, and your partner. <laughs> but I knew you'd appreciate that. That's a good story, right? <laughs> it's a good story. It's almost as good as the lightly shat office chair. <laughs> Come on. We love this stuff, don't we? All right. So coming up, we've got the um, the burning platform. But let me first tell you that what psych- a morning. What a morning. Psychiatry is among is unique among medical disciplines in embracing a truly holistic approach to patient assessment and care. However, in their desire for acceptance and credibility as a medical discipline, has psychiatry strayed from what makes it unique? Has it overcompensated biologically in order to be v- viewed as truly medical? These questions, and I mean, those are good questions. They're tackled on the latest episode of Beyond Madness. Brought to you in proud association with Adcock, Ingram, OTC, the sponsors of Brave. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The team from uh, Beyond Madness looking inward this week. Psychiatry, not psychology. No, psychiatry. This is fascinating. So I think I'll be listening to that episode for sure. And then a little later today, I'm going to be... uh, playing out my interview at 8 a.m. with Ben Goldsmith. So straight after the show this morning, you can watch the video and uh, Gareth's guests, or you can go to our YouTube channel. And please, if you're on our YouTube channel right now, or you're going to be later, like and subscribe. It helps with the numbers. People look at those things, even though I'm not particularly interested. It means a lot to us. You have to do it. Ben Goldsmith has written a beautiful book about a horrible tragedy after he lost his teenage daughter in a freak accident on their farm in 2019. He was drowning in the depths of grief and despair. His deeply personal story of how he found his way back through the healing power of nature is both moving and inspirational for anyone who's experienced a great loss. And I had a really fascinating chat to him. He's a great human being. I met him in 2018 in London. And uh, we had a long conversation about all kinds of interesting things. He obviously has had a really terrible time of it since then, but has Come emerged on the other side, despite you know no no parent wants to lose their child, and he's emerged on the other side of it a stronger person. So worth listening to Ben Goldsmith, who also has a fascinating family. You know, his sister is Jemima Khan, who oh. is uh, mar- was mar- was married to Imran Khan. His brother is uh, the minister for environmental affairs right now in in the UK. Um, his father was a very very wealthy um, entrepreneur. His mother is Annabelle. Annabelle Goldsmith, who um, attended uh, Wimbledon just the other day with Camilla. Mm. So these are well-connected people, interesting people. And Ben is a really great writer. And uh, I think he's got some some useful experiences to share, and, and especially for those people who are going through a hard time and dealing with grief and with uh, the loss of, of someone. And we all are at some point in our lives. It's worth taking a listen to this. It may just be helpful and you could use this information in your own life. So coming up in the burning platform, I know Pumi's very excited about this, so am I. For the first time in a long time, we've got someone from the EFF, from their central command team, and also a member of parliament. It is none other than Dogozo Klonyan, who's going to be joining us. And Dogozo is a member of the EFF, and it's their 10th anniversary this month. So we're going to talk about that. What are their plans for the upcoming elections, et cetera, et cetera. Also be joined by Mighty Jamie, who, of course, has been on the show a number of times. We're thrilled to have him back. Researcher, analyst, and commentator, he will be joining us in the Burning Platform in just a short while. Stick around for that and a whole lot more. CliffCentral.com. It is Thursday morning. There is only one place on Cliff Central for 80s movie recommendations. Obscure 80s references. 80s crushes and it's the only place on cliff central with the best 80s songs you forgot how much you loved that 80s show fridays 9 a.m on cliff central people say we're stuck in the 80s like it's a bad thing 
Hi, I'm Barrett Edelstein. Join me for my podcast, Lab Savant. Today I'm with Sophie Ellis Baxter. So, right at the moment, I'm at home in London, but after I speak to you, I'm going to pack my bags. Three of the members of UB40, Earl, Matt, and Jimmy. Well, we're in the middle of a tour at the moment. A career retrospective with actors, singers, and entertainment industry experts every Friday morning at nine o'clock on cliffcentral.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts. This week on the Auto Trader Podcast. What cars have, have been able to do is they've, they've changed how people interact with the world and each other and accessibility to things. I mean, we always talk about why the first car essentially gives people freedom. Um, it offers you an opportunity to f- get a job wherever you want. Mm. Um, it, it gives you an opportunity to change your lifestyle. Um, and I think that's kind of the big difference that, that I, I have against you know people who think you know, rock. I mean, rockets are cool, planes are cool. But I think in terms of everything, cars are, have definitely made the biggest impact, including trucking and logistics. Yeah, I mean, um, it's created freedom. Mm. It's created independence. Mm. Um, it's created the ability to make the world smaller. Mm. You know, besides the internet, that's made the world smaller now. Because you know, with the internet, you need to be able to deliver stuff. Yeah. And cars are critical to that, uh, to that chain. Mm. To their value chain, so, so, uh, so, so the internet is in the the, the reality of the internet and um, and click to buy or e commerce. All right, good morning, everybody. It is uh, the burning platform. Time for us to check in on the big stories of the week, and we have a full house today. It looks like everybody's here, and we're very, very pleased about that. We got Pumi, we got Mighty Jamie, and I'm very pleased to welcome Dogozo who's from the EFF. We haven't had the EFF in here for a while. In fact, we've been, uh, to- I know Ryan's been trying to get you guys in here because it is your 10th year. Mm-hmm. I remember one of the, in fact, he was the first person I interviewed after we started Cliff Central was your commander in chief. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> we've, um, we've been interested to watch your journey as we've grown, you guys have grown. And obviously things are happening for the EFF. So it's very nice to see you. Uh, Pumelele, where do we want to begin today? Jamie, by the way, uh, it's also good to have you here again, because the last time you were here, you and Pumi had an argument about, um, I can't even remember what it was. <laughs> He's ungovernable. I can't believe we let him back in well, the door. Ungovernable as he is, people <laughs> like to hear from him. And he says some sensible things, Pumi. So you've got to, you've got to acknowledge that um, at least we, we, we like having people in here with contrary opinions to our own. But I do remember the last time you two had a proper argument and it was fantastic. I love an <laughs> argument. You so, know why I am so excited to have you here? Is because of the birthday celebrations. Of course. And because, because of the press conference mm-hmm. that Julius had a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Are you here to name and shame all of those people that did not <laughs> get the buses Actually, together? I am here to talk about the celebration. It's the biggest celebration that South Africa will ever see. I mean, it's the first time we see a political party that have started from the beginning and now where we are. I mean, you had other political parties that have failed, like Ahang, uh, Cope, the fact that EFF is turning 10 is one of the biggest achievement, I think, in the history of South Africa. But I think it's important to have a conversation, particularly about that celebration, because we didn't know what was tasked, what all the people were tasked with mm-hmm. until Julius had the press conference mm-hmm. to tell us that there was a directive put out and that the people did not meet the requirements and that he is the one that said they would be named and shamed. I've been patiently so who are the, waiting to see what the did these list. people not do or do? I'm, I'm confused. 
Okay, before is this, we... Is this for the celebrations itself? Yes, it is particularly for the celebrations. Service providers who did not deliver. <laughs> who? I don't it's understand. The commissars no. who did not deliver. Okay, before we come there, you see, we must talk about the celebration <laughs> in totality. You know, we must be able to explain to the people that EFF is 10 in 10. We're going to be having the celebration of the poor on the 29th of July, 2023. But, um, and that's going to be at the uh, FNB Stadium. When you have a celebration for the poor, what do you what do you, what do you put on there? It's a celebration for the poor. Well, we're just going to be having the biggest time of our life, and it's been a build up by okay, the way. Okay, but like, what do we? Uh, who 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 qualifies as the poor? Everybody. Who Can anybody to, come? Ev- it's ev- the rest. Of, all what do you of do South if so, what do you do, what if you do if like a a, a powerful cigarette magnate uh, arrives there and says he's among the poor? Do you do you keep him in there as well? All South Africans are invited <laughs> to come and celebrate the 10 years of uh, unbroken struggle that the EFF have delivered to the people of South Africa. All right. Yes. We, we will we'll perhaps get onto this a little bit later on because I know Pumi has lots to ask you about this. But uh, Dogozo, I just want to ask you, as a member of parliament, mm. how's parliament doing? Because you guys still haven't moved back into your building. <laughs> Parliament's a disaster. We haven't had an MP in here for a long time. Mm. And it seems to me like you've just settled into the Cape Town City Hall like forever now. I mean, is there anything being done there? Have they have they updated you? Have public works come to you guys and said, hey, by the way, you, you can resume your offices there. We can carry on with sessions of parliament from there. Or is it a disaster? It is a disaster because since they conned it off, uh, nothing has happened. I mean, we do go there and um, as committees do sit. Um, other members do join via Zoom as well. Uh, but... Nothing has really been happening much. And that is why the EFF kept on calling that the parliament should be moved to Pretoria. I mean, we've been calling for that for the longest time now to say, why don't we move um, parliament to Pretoria? It's going to be uh, cheaper, actually. You are going to have both parliament there and you're going to have the departments as well there. So it's going to just make sense if you just move parliament to Pretoria. Um, But you can tell that they don't want. They want us to keep on flying up and down. Yeah, they like spending money. They like um, spending money. You know, you keep MPs there, you know, housing for them, Mm -hmm. housing for ministers. They don't want to make sure that at least we would have had a lot of money if we would have managed to. I completely um, agree with you. Push parliament to. You will find, uh, Dogoza, during the course of this conversation, there are actually going to be many things you and I agree on. Mm -hmm. And the audience will be, uh, there will be consternation about some of these (laughs) things. But I'm with you on that. And I also think that there are too many people in uh, the situation who are on the take, who have no interest in fixing things. I mean, now we just saw this disaster in Johannesburg, right? Mm. And I don't know which ward you represent or which, uh, who you're actually an MP for mm. in terms of your constituency, but Johannesburg is now a toilet and it's a cracked toilet. It's not even a good toilet anymore. And it's just embarrassing to me that we don't have a parliament that works. We don't have a, our main city, the main economic hub is now, looks like a war zone. Um, we know Etequini's got huge problems with sewage fly, flowing all over the place. Uh, during those riots and during the floods, people are still living in squalor there. So take our three biggest cities. There are horrible disasters in all three. All three of them look like shitholes, like Donald Trump called us ages ago. And I mean, this is just a horrible state of affairs to find ourselves in. I find it very difficult to be positive as a South African at the moment. So if your 10-year celebration gives people who support you and you guys a reason to celebrate, I'm all for it. Honestly, it, we're it looking for reasons. It does look very bad, but there is hope. And we always tell people that, um, you know, the only way that you can change the situation in this country is by voting the ANC out. And that's just that. South Africans need to come out in their numbers next year and they need to go and make sure that they vote and they they do the correct thing and they vote for the EFF and make sure that they vote the ANC out. Because as long as the ANC is still in power, you are still going to have such situations because the ANC does not care about anybody else except the ANC. They put themselves first. The cadres of the ANC put themselves forward and they put themselves first and they don't care about any other thing that happens in this country except what's in for them. And that is one of the biggest challenges that are facing right now. Dogo, so how do you then reconcile that statement and that stance with what we have seen in the municipalities like in Johannesburg, like in Eguruleni, where the EFF have then aligned themselves with the ANC? Mm. How do you reconcile those two things? So you say to people they must vote the ANC out. 
And if they do vote for you, you use those votes to align with the ANC. Okay, maybe let me correct this because I know a lot of it's been marriages, people have to say coalitions and alignments. <clears throat> We're not aligned to anybody. We made a decision as the central command team that we're going to now participate in government so that South Africans can be able to see how we govern. And I'm sure you have seen that where we have taken um, MMCs, we have actually been doing quite well. Take, for example, in Johannesburg, the health uh, department, you have now come to see that we have clinics that are opening now 24 hours. We're making sure that everything functions and is properly functioning well. But that didn't happen in the last 18 months. No, it is happening right now. No, but what I'm saying is, for instance, the clinic in Alexander has been opening late since, I think, 2018, before that. So it's not the function of the MMC being an EFF member that now not the only, clinics open that way. Not only do you find that clinics were open, but you find that clinics were open, but there was actually no staff and there was no medicine. So we are making sure that everything within the clinics are now functioning and are functioning properly. You know, we had another little incident, which was amazing, where you find that the generator hasn't been working. It was just a simple matter of maintenance. It, mm. it Nothing was needed, which was major. It was just a maintenance so issue. I, d I just want to like caution, and of course, you know, Everyone here is allowed to ask whatever questions they want. But I, I do think it's worth us looking at the bigger picture Ooh. today because we don't really have an opportunity too often to have the EFF in here, just like we had the ANC Youth League the other day and we all piled on about all the ANC issues. Um, while I think that there are lots of things that we will disagree about, Ooh. and I'm sure Jamie's got some questions for you too, I do think Pumi's point's relevant. It's like, what kinds of coalitions, because you guys aren't going to outright become the government. There's no possibility of that in 2024 even though you probably have dreams of that coming to to materialize who would you be prepared to sit down and talk to because julius made some comments about this just this week yeah with the just this week, yeah and he said we're prepared to talk to anyone if they don't want to talk to us fine that sounds to me like a sensible approach because you should in politics be able to compromise in an effort to try and bring about the right kinds of changes you know, um, do you want to comment on that and say who yeah. you think is and isn't a potential you partner? Know, Garrett, let me tell you, we have always been open. Um, and I can take you back to 2016, um, the, the, the local government elections, uh, where we sent out as the central command team a delegation to actually go and speak to everybody to say, this is our demands that we wanted um, as the EFF. And then anybody who will then at least meet us halfway, we were willing to work with them. We have always put the people first and not ourselves. And it was a serious thing that we entered because we decided not to take government in 2016 at all. We could have participated in it, but we decided not to because we knew at that particular time that we're not ready as the organization. But now we are, and that is why we're now participating in government. So, right. you know... The moon pack short, eh, yeah, yes, <coughs> you know that one. I, yes. You know, um, it's fine. Let them go in August and do whatever that they want to do and speak about whatever that they want to speak about. Obviously, they are allowed to. But it's, it, it, it puzzles me what type of a, a political party that can want to go to the election already thinking that they're going to lose that election. We are working very hard as the organization. I mean, we last year we had a one million uh, membership um registration campaign that we had now we have a five million where we are registering new members like new people in the IEC just, to make sure for, that we have our own voters for context because i know jamie's got lots of questions he wants to ask you but um just give us a little bit of a story about how you got involved in the eff and your own background yeah your own background me myself yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's talk about okay. you for a second i mean it's not gonna well maybe as we celebrate the 10 years um everybody has their story to tell we want to hear yours. Um, well, I joined the EFF in 2013. Um, I think I was one of the fortunate ones because I've managed to serve in the branch. I've served in the provincial level and now I'm in the national level. So it's one of those where you understand properly your what has been happening and who we are as the organization. 2013 was a very beautiful year indeed. A lot of people thought that we were never going to make it. Uh, but here we are now, we have made it. So one of the reasons that I joined the EFF is the language that the EFF was speaking about, uh, socialization, socialism. And they were also speaking about 
putting <clears throat> the dignity of a, a black person um, up front. You know, they were fighting for a lot of things, including trying to make sure that we correct the what have happened in the past. Um, but above everything else was to make sure that South Africa has a future. And if you have realized what happened in 2013 is that a lot of people who joined the EFF were not politicians. Literally, a lot of people who joined the EFF were people who were just tired of uh, the status quo of what was happening in this country and they needed a change. And I think maybe that is one of the reasons we have survived the way that we have survived because it was not people who say, I want to be a member of parliament or I want to be a councillor. It was literally people who just said, I want a change and I'm going to give my ultimate best to make sure that I give my two cents or my five cents or my 10 cents to make sure that we can change the status quo in this country. So, okay. yeah. So right. I joined in 2013 and it's been wonderful ever since. So you're pretty much a, like a founder member then. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's interesting. All right. So Jamie, uh, you, you've been very seriously taking notes. Go ahead. You, you want to put some questions to Ndogozo? Well, I mean, I don't have questions so much as comments about this um, coalition, the moonshot one as a starting point. All right. Because I think everyone is thinking about coalitions because they are a factor. They're frustrating everybody and... Everyone's trying to figure out how do we navigate this space? And I think your question about everyone making some kind of deal with the ANC at some level, but then saying that they want to go against the ANC confuses the electorate. And when I think about the moonshot, what confused me about the way the DA set up their conversation was that they came out and said, we've got two enemies, the ANC and the EFF. I thought, okay, this is a bit strange because everyone's frustrated with the ANC. Why are you also picking a second enemy when you could have just come and said, we need to get the ANC out of government and we need to do so in the most strategic ma manner possible. So if you've got a party that is polling between 10 and 13%, depending on what poll you look at, why would you want to exclude them from the conversation from the jump? I thought that was confusing. I thought those terms of reference for a starting conversation were wrong. And maybe that's why John shouldn't have been the person to lead this conversation. I think this should have been led actually by a retired politician, somebody who's not active in the game. Problem is none of them bloody retire. That's that's, that's a challenge. Maybe like... <laughs> they all stick around for far too long. <laughs> for instance... Someone like, should talk to Bantu Olomisa <laughs> seriously and say to him, that it's time. And Mosio and Mosio Lakota. I mean, someone's going to talk to them, right? That's oh, don't be that person. Okay. Janen has no? serving. So let me stick to the main point. So let's assume we could get the gift of the givers <laughs> leader to convene a conversation, right? Because okay, he right. he's actually and... he's done more public service than uh, anyone in government, and he's a neutral okay. guy, right? So everyone respect him. If, if we had that kind of an umbrella, I think you could have people coming in and having a conversation about. What does a government look like under a coalition of, you know, um, different political parties with different ideologies, but who, who are trying to serve a South Africa that is genuinely frustrated with the way the cities are looking, the way the country is looking? That is something that I think could have worked more than this particular moonshot type of framework. The reason why I, I'm, I'm making this comment is it's so difficult. If you look at Turkey. It's so difficult to beat incumbents. Mm -hmm. And they're difficult to beat Especially because... Especially when they're crooked like uh, Erdogan. <laughs> Erdogan. Yeah. But if, if you were to think that uh, Erdogan is, 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 is a bit crooked, wouldn't that same argument extend to the ANC? Oh, they're all crooked. So And, and, and if you look at the way... I'm Banyaza, not going to get any... We are making sure that we are going to make sure that President Julius Malema becomes the president of the Republic of South Africa next year. Okay, now come to my question about if he's the president of South Africa, what is this, what is still attractive about this philosophy that, that you guys on the left are still obsessed with years and years after it has proved to have failed everywhere else? And I don't want to be mean, but you don't control a single municipality in this country. You guys don't have any experience in government whatsoever. And the idea that you would not only come in and try to fix and maintain things, let me take you at your word and say that you, your intentions appear and you want to make the country run better and you want to look after poor people and you want to do good things. Let me accept that that is true. And I'm not going to argue with that whether you, I mean, for all the people in the comments who are saying, oh, but the EFF is this and that, I'm going to take you at your word. To implement then 
the most destructive system of the last 150 years. Why would you do that? You know, Garrett, the problem is that we live in the world where capital, capitalism yeah. will always make sure that they win in the end of the day. But it's just a free market. You know this. I mean, like, don't you and I want to be able to trade if you've got a nice EFF jersey that I let, want? Let her finish her No, no, but, but if, we've got to define here because capitalism mm. is different to what I think the EFF can sort of capitalism to be. So if I want your jersey, I'll pay you a fair price. If you don't want to accept my price, you don't have to give me your jersey. That's all free markets are. Well, it depends on how you, you put... Okay, let's then take it to the South African content and what we're faced with right now. Mm -hmm. You know... We start by saying that we want expropriation of land without compensation for equal distribution in use. The reality is, in this country, we don't own anything. You know, our own country does not own anything on the basis that the land is not with us. You know, you can't do anything without the land. Let's start there But first. that's not a true statement. The state owns more land than any other entity. No, it does not. It absolutely no, does. It does you can look at the land registrations. It you can, you can go, to, you go to the deeds office. You could yeah, see it. It does not. It so where did you not. get that fact? It does not. You made it up. The state it does not. It Who does? does? Not. It's privately owned. Most of this country is privately owned. That's yes. absolutely not true. It is kind of privately owned. It is privately owned. And that's one of the biggest challenges that we're faced. You're not telling me with, where you know that in, from. I'm telling you, it you is privately it owned. Up. It's not made up. Because but if you, okay. Okay, here's what. Here's yeah, what yeah, I uh, have a question. I, I have a, a slightly different question because we're not moving forward from this. All right. What are the top three policy priorities for the EFF and explain it to me like I'm an 18 year old first time <laughs> voter okay the first one is expropriation of South African land without compensation for equal distribution and then the second what one, does that mean if I'm an 18 year old okay we, what does that mean okay we want to make sure that the state owns the land so that because they've run everything else so well. No, no, no. But you see, you, you, <laughs> no, that's the end stage. Don't, don't, don't okay. say right, that. Right. that I'm not going to distract. Carry on. Carry, this carry on. Moment carry on. Is carry on. owned by the ANC. Mm. So everything that people speak about, they speak about the ANC <laughs> and not <laughs> us. So the first thing that we want, we want expropriation of land. The 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 state must be the custodian. Everyone's what land. What does that mean? Everyone's land will be taken does away and mean, then redistributed. Yeah. So what does that mean? Does that mean nobody owns a house? Nobody owns their land? It is all owned by the country? Yeah, how do the we do that practically? Via the EFF, decide who gets to do what. You apply. You make an application. No, I, and then is you that say, what it means? Yeah. First answer yes. my question with yes so or no. So this is what's going to happen. Now the land is in the custodian of the state, right? So all those let, people who paid for their properties or who have most of their wealth in their properties, it's all gone. Let me explain, Garrett. Mm. Now, I am, for example, we have a lot of land that is just sitting around that's not doing anything. You have people who will tell you, I'm having a farm, a farm, don't, don't. And then when you go there, you find that there's only one ostrich there. There are literally, there's land. There is a lot of things that we could use building industries within this country, okay, but, but we cannot do it on the basis that we don't have land. Okay, but, People but you're don't talking, have a place You're to talking stay. about the leftover land. No, what no. about Pumi's house and my house and Jamie's house? No, but those imagine, are, imagine we own, what happens to that? Because you've expropriated everything. What happens to the existing value of the economy? And especially what happens if the bank is owed more than the property's worth? Does the EFF and the state then take on the debt as well? What happens? You know, Garrett, what they've happened is that when we started or when they, when we begin to start about the expropriation uh, bill, what happened was that you, you, you saw how the land was just, the prices just went very high, like in South Africa. All of a sudden where, you know, people were, the people who owns the land in this country started even rebonding those, uh, taking money against those so that they can make sure that the situation becomes very difficult in terms but when the time comes for let's us. Let's just to go back to, to expropriate. How is expropriation so, going to work? I think this is because yeah, we've never had this explained to us properly. This, and this and, is why I insist 
that you explain it to me as you would to a new voter, because mm. these are the people you want to give you the mandate. So what I want to understand is who gets what and who is in charge of making sure that that happens. Okay, so the EFF approach on the land expropriation without compensation is that all the land should be transferred to the ownership and custodianship of the state, right? With how it was done with the minerals um, and petroleum resource where everything was transferred to the state. If you need to go and apply for mine, you go to the to the state and you apply for it and then but that's they fine make with sure it. that but, they give but, it to you. Tokoza, that's fine with the mine, but are we going to empty people from their houses, put them in the CBD, mm. which is cracked, <laughs> and then decide by this application process who gets to go back into their houses? I mean, why would anyone tolerate that? Yeah. The poor or the rich? Why would anyone yeah. put up with that? Yeah, what's, right. what's the upshot? So now... Now, even if this could possibly work, and I know you can't explain a way of it for it to work because there's just no way. Mm. If it did in your dream scenario, the EFF has this fantasy world where this could happen. Now you've distributed the land equally to everybody. What now? Okay. So, they don't own it. So there's no reason for that because the state owns it. Okay. So state custodianship, right, of the land. It means that those who currently occupy the land should apply for licenses and continue using the land and should clearly state in the application of what they want to do with the land. Like, for example, you will be able to. It's just that Gareth wants to simplify this thing to a house. We're not speaking about but your most house. Most people no. live, most so people do not a, live in rural I'm areas not asking looking to farm. To simplify it to a house. Mm. I just want it, like Jamie said earlier, that it confuses the electorate, mm. right? So, what we are talking about, and that's why I specifically said, explain it like you would to an 18 year old, mm. right? Is what I would like to understand is what it is that you stand for. So when you say land, there are many people in this country who live in rural areas who will leave the land and live in a mkuku just outside Johannesburg because that land to them does not offer opportunity or value. They would rather come to Joburg and look for a job. So, and for me, this is one of the reasons why the EFF struggles to get voters outside of metropolitan areas, right? Because we don't understand what it is that you are talking about. Okay. But, okay, so we're not going to move from this. You, you are unable to explain it to mm. us, and I, and I accept that. What is your second priority? But I've explained it, but it's okay. Well, that's all right. Yeah, but we don't understand what you're chose, saying. We've chosen so to hasn't move on. Been so what's we want the, what's to the nationalize second one? the nationalization of mines, banks, and other strategic sectors of the economy. So that is seriously critical because we live in the world where we don't, the, the state does not own, or South Africans don't own their own minds. And therefore, a person comes from outside and they can do whatever they want. They can mine. They even don't even want to pay the taxes, which they should be paying. And that's where you get those illicit flows that comes in into, pl into play. So we want to make sure that um, the nationalization of mine banks and other strategic uh, sectors of the economy are done, are built, building a state and governance capacity, which will lead to the abolishment of the tenders. Um, we also want free quality education, healthcare, houses and sanitation for all. We want massive protected industrial development to create millions of sustainable jobs in this country. How do you create jobs? You create jobs firstly by making sure that you stabilize your issue of energy. Let's start there first. But, you, but why would people work in this EFF utopia? Because you can't own your house. You can't own things. You can't go anywhere. Why would you work? Why would anyone work? Yeah, right. Everybody is going to work. Because why? Everybody's going but to But explain get a why. Good job. What job? Is the state going to employ everybody? No, the state is not going to employ everybody. So what, but, who would want to run? But, who, like, where would you borrow money to start your business in the EFF utopia if the bank belongs to the EFF or to the, the government? No, it, it doesn't. Be Why would the government, the government doesn't lend people money. Okay. In any country. No, but it can. If we wanted to design it that way, what, it can. Where are you going to get taxes state... from if you take away people's businesses and houses and you take away the banks and you take away the mines, where's tax money going to come from? Where's the government going to be able to fund itself? 
No, we're not These taking like away basic people's questions. base. We're not taking away people's businesses. We're simply saying that we must have a state bank. We're not saying that other banks must no longer exist, but we're saying that no, we you must said you're going to take over the banks. We must you, have you didn't a say, state. No, you bank. said. I'm just going to quote you here. You said we will take over strategic things like the banks. Yes. So that means the other banks won't exist. The government will take over. They're allowed it to exist. No one is saying that. You, Why would they want to compete to with a state bank when you'll give the state bank preferential? regulatory capacities and, and the ability to make but its own rules. But why not? Because the state bank is actually <clears throat> going to assist our people. People will pay less in, you do, I mean, in you guys, rates. I, I also have a question around our people, mm. that particular phrase. Who is excluded from our people? When you say our people, who is excluded? The white monopoly capital. Who uh, Who is that? What does that look like white monopoly capital is who the white monopoly capital is the people who are in charge of um production in this country who are those people my people when i say our people garrett is my people you are my people of course you are people you don't own the means of production you are just a normal south african citizen who's making sure but that i own the means of production here oh producing this podcast no that could, could, under your definition, you could take that away. No, you come could call on. Me white, you could call me white monopoly no, capital. No, Garrett, no. You no? Don't, no. So who is? Just the very rich ones. Yes, your okay, Oppenheimers so, okay. and your Rothschilds. So it's a wealth grab. Yes. This is just a wealth grab. This sounds like when a child sees another child has stuff and they just take it from them. But, Banks, but, but, mines, no, property, no. businesses. Yeah, that's what it sounds let's like. Let's be charitable to them uh, a little bit because I feel like <laughs> Garrett has... Um, straw man some of the well, arguments okay then you you help them go so on. so i think the land conversation just to go first to the the question around what land reasonably do socialists speak about right you're talking about mining land you're talking about um farm farm land and in um and agricultural holdings right and when you look at the land audit what it showed there is that 97 percent of farms and agricultural holdings are owned by 7% of As they the would be in almost every country in the world, sure. But when you then consider <clears throat> the historical context... Because farming of, is hard, by the way. I mean, that's why. That's why 7% of the people have to farm the land to get the maximum production out of it so we can eat. You know what? But okay. In a, in a general um, conversation about markets and free markets and social markets, etc., that premise would be you know, debatable without adding additional context. But here, we have to remember that a lot of this farmland was dispossessed violently under a creation of a set of laws which discriminated on race. But you've and, got to prove that on a case-by-case -case basis. We can't, we, so, can't, I mean, we can't make a generalization. Some people have paid in the last 10 years for a farm. Holistically, and you're not wrong about that, which mm. is what makes uh, history uh, a, a complex uh, subject because yeah, so we can't we all living in a continuation of of a historical spectrum you know as much as you, you could have bought a, 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 a let's say a vineyard in, in in stellenbosch legitimately most of those belong to foreigners what, mean, would you, what would you do about those 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 must be expropriated as well right but um, no, before, we, I mean, so is that is that a thing foreigners can't own land surely under the eff's the land must be owned by the state there we go but but you get what i'm saying right i'm not talking about some of the additional dynamics I'm talking about when you look at the land um, ownership patterns in South Africa, they okay, would but, seem to most people but Jenny, to you be said unjust. I'm, you said I'm straw manning her argument. She's just said again, and I'm going to take her at a word. I believe her. I take her seriously. She says all the land will belong to the state. So why are you arguing for something? No, that I'm, she didn't I'm, say I'm, she I'm, I'm contextualizing what I think is the fair terrain. Are around... you mansplaining her? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I, I think when we and I'm not talking For about me. the banks or whatever. I think no, the land it's, conversation. It's important. It's important to understand because as a, um, a member of the working committee, is it working committee or war room? Which one is it again? War Please remind me. War the council. war council, right? I think she she has a, a thorough grasp of what it is that the policy is, and her argument is is that all the land. That is what you're, is no, that's what you're this, saying. This, what and I'm what you are saying is you you are then saying you feel a need to clarify what no, she is No, no, no. I'm clarifying what I think Jer Gareth has done, which is so I'm, I'm Gareth explaining, if okay. anything, because right. Gareth said 
what is the land ownership pattern in South Africa? And he said that the state owns most of the land. And, yeah, and then what you, I then you, said then is you that redefine. the land audit says yes, but you, that you, you uh, agricultural land agricultural is land. But there is so much land in this country that is not agricultural land, that's zoned for military, that's zoned for public works, that is now being incorporated into uh, townships and suburbs around Johannesburg and Pretoria and all these places that are growing, that is government land. It's obviously owned by the state. And if you do a proper land audit of all the all the land, not just the agricultural land, you'll see that that is in fact the, the, the case. When we're talking about land in the context of a South African political conversation, right, there are three types of land that you're talking about, right? It's Some land is not... Is not um, arable. Arable and it's not we, we're uh, talking hospitable, about right? We're talking and about all people, land. Doggers have said all land, so I don't know why we're breaking it down. I'm, 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 I just thought it was a little bit of a straw man. Not at all, because it's I, mining I, I land. I think I've been clear. I, farming both land. Both doggers and I quite clear. Like land. we mean all land, right? We mean all land. You and I in this discussion. There we go. But your focus of the I conversation. Told you, I, told I told you you'd yeah, find no, it funny how man. much I agree with the EFF. This is on the straw man. <laughs> the straw man I'm pointing out is some of your arguments about residential land, like your house, right? doesn't necessarily apply to um, farmland, which was... Um, you're complicating a quite simple issue. She said all land. So I now, think there's a straw so, man so somewhere pull, Okay, but, but then put me... Let's go back to her question. Three things. So the first one was the land. The second one was the strategic resources and minerals in the bank, nationalize all of that stuff. And the third and one the third was... The third one is building state and government capacity, okay. which, lead, which would lead to the abolishment of tenders. Now, no one would be against that. <laughs> But that isn't number one. That's number three. <laughs> when people have researched, and Jamie can back me up on this, because he, I know you, you look at these surveys and you take them seriously and you probably interpret them with more time and effort than I do. So I'm willing to be corrected. But the land does not come up as a priority for the majority of South Africans. Well, you know, what? it's not even in the top 10 as far as I've seen. What, what, I've, what I've come to find is that there's a bit of a disconnect, right, uh, between some of the official polling data and some of the discourse on the ground. So when I look at the, the polls, right, Ipsos, uh, Social Research Foundation, several others, mm -hmm. land doesn't show up. Yeah. But oftentimes um, when I am in either I'm a social <laughs> listening or um, I've just been living life, prize, et cetera, et cetera. In black communities, that is something that I often hear about a lot. For instance, at, the, at, at my university where I studied, there was a big uh, talking point amongst the students. And that may be a generational thing. Yeah. But I've often found that there's a bit of a disconnect between um, what I hear on the ground but, sometimes but, and what the polling indicates. And as we know, I mean, from I mean, American and European elections, uh, polling isn't always accurate, especially absolutely. when you're Couldn't polling people. But then and, let's, be, let's be careful not to say like among black people, because again, there's huge differences between ex people like MPs or, or cabinet ministers when they have a bri, they're not talking of about course, anything and, but and, themselves. And, and and I and, can't give you outside and, of that. No, um, of course. But I mean, when you say you, you certainly can't say like black people think X or Y, which would be hugely insulting. And we don't have to go down that. Uh -uh. You, it depends. So, so um, you say, you're saying that maybe these polls are skewed and that they don't know black. Yeah, people. I'm saying that <laughs> there are two types of generalizations. Yeah. One is a hasty generalization, one that is not founded on any scientific basis whatsoever. And then there's a statistical generalization, which can be founded on proper research, uh, sure. listening, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm saying to you is I've tried to reconcile the gap between okay. um, and what, have you what the polling has indicated and what um, you know the, the land discourse sometimes is on social media platforms, et cetera. And you think it's probably more important than those surveys show? Yes. Okay. So I think that in, right. in the Fair dispossessed enough. communities where people don't have land well, that would or be, ownership of land, that which would are be predominantly great. black, it is a bigger issue uh, than, for instance, the DA would think so it is. So then that would be great news for the EFF. I think that's that why mean, they have 10%. That would mean that they have their finger on the pulse of what most people in this country are actually concerned with. And maybe their three priorities are the three priorities. What do you say, Pumi? We have seven, actually. Seven. Oh, there's some more. Yeah. Okay. So after number three, which is like we build. have free quality education, healthcare, houses, and sanitation. Who's paying for that? Because we can't even get the NIH off the ground. I mean, none of our government hospitals work. You see, the problem is. I mean, I'm just taking health again. No, no. You are so, looking at the eye of the country, which is run and, by the and ANC. See, I understand, but where would the EFF do better? How would you do better? Would you? How would you appoint people like? in a better way than the ANC have. Okay. They would be cadres, but they would be EFF cadres. Oh. 
how would it how would it work you know what we okay you know cadet deployment in the eff is actually not one of our things we 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 actually deploy people on basis of their strength if tomorrow there is a skill that we do not have in house we'll go and fetch somebody it doesn't mean that because you must be a member of the where would you get doctors and nurses and hospital managers because those people aren't going to hang around if you take away their property oh my god Garrett, stop thinking about your house no, i'm not about, thinking about as my he's explaining, everybody but but as he's of, explaining is, to you you are looking most at people, this in a very small scale okay, of so, way of so most people at things. most people look at their budget every month yes i mean we're all normal people none of us are supremely rich none of us are supremely poor we we all managing to eke out a living right and I take you as an MP. You're not on a huge salary. People always say MPs earn this Ooh, huge amount of money. You don't, right? But <laughs> all of us, we think about how much we have to spend every month. We think about what our priorities are. Having a roof over your head is a pretty, pretty big priority yes. for most people. And I'm not simplifying this. Mm. I don't think I'm being unkind or straw manning here. Well, you know, you know, what, I mean, Karen. these are things that most people think about. You need transport. You need accommodation. You need food. After that, all the other stuff you can start figuring out. Am I right? So look, I don't support uh, land expropriation without compensation, right? Because I think um, at the private property level of the house ownership, you have some issues. But I do think that there's a conversation that is important to have about land injustice in South Africa, because it's, it's, it seems to me um, cruel to insist on the current land ownership patterns when you have- Is this you because know, you think it's, it's unequal and unfair? I think first and foremost, the way everyone got to most of their addresses is based on history, not necessarily just mere merit. You know, if you- um, That's had, true for everything. True for how you get to school. It's how you get to your job. Exactly. But, but it's how but, you get healthcare. It's how exactly. you get everything. So it's not, this is not a pure meritocratic outcome is sure, what I'm saying. Not. 2023 is not a result of people who just started off from an of even not. starting point. But if, if, if the EFF had their way and the state redistributed all of that and changed, started history again, you know, like they did in Stalinist Russia, would that be the same? Well, this is, so I'm not, I'm not going to make their point for them, right? That's why I'm <laughs> saying that when I look at the um, land distribution patterns in South Africa, mm. there is a massive injustice and cruelty there, right? To and to insist like, upon cruelty it. is a is a is a hell of a word. Explain that. It's it's cruel for people who own a lot of land and have lived affluent lives, and some of that land ownership, especially if you look at um, you said seven percent. So seven yeah, percent yeah. of the people in this country are cruel. No, what I'm saying is insisting on the the status quo which is to say, hey, let's say, for example, someone lives in, in, in Houghton or whatever, and they say, well, I, I, I'm in Houghton, I'm comfortable here. You must continue to be comfortable in Alex, and we don't have to have a conversation about the... I don't think anyone thinks... Do you, find me a person who would say that publicly. So when, when Who people, would say that? When, when what people, kind of person would go around going... No, no, it's absolutely fine that there are people who live in absolute poverty. There's so, no one in any of the parties that I could think of. Would, can you, Dogozo? Is there anyone in the EFF, the DA, the ANC would go, yeah, it's fine for those poor people. So we all poor. agree that land land needs uh, to be, uh, the, land the land question needs to be resolved one way or another, right? Uh, in terms of the conversation we have outside of the nationalization one. Mm -hmm. So in this room, we agree. Then the question then becomes, what then do you do? Because when it gets personal, right, when you then say, let's put affordable housing in uh, C point, then people say, well, I don't want affordable housing in my neighborhood because that's going to depreciate the value of my property. Mm -hmm. Then that's when you start to hear the, the, the little cruelty there because okay, it's not cruelty. That's just, you don't, you but, want to, but then what do I we mean, do? Why, do, why, we do? Why, are, why are black people moving into suburbs that were 80% white and, and, they're happy to do so by their own free will. You can't say that those people are making decisions about uh, property values and being cruel. They want their kids to grow up in a nice neighborhood. So at an at a individual level, your argument is solid. No question about it. Everyone wants to live in the best. But you must look at best. everything on an individual level. You, not, no, that's, you way, make, that's not, You and Pumi and I are making policy. Dogozo is, and she's told us her policy. I, I would disagree with somebody who makes that liberal argument that everything needs to be looked at at an individual level because some things are social and some things are community-based, right? And if you only look at your safety in your neighborhood as Gareth, 
you may not live in a very safe neighborhood because sometimes you have to collaborate on safety. And that's why we have all of these safety companies and interventions and gated communities, yeah, et cetera. Secure, private security, we have police. But I, I think that we, we are currently stuck in a quagmire around this issue of land and what the meanings of all of those things are. And I think we're missing the opportunity with having Dogozo here of, of really digging deep into the mind of this organization and understanding. And, and I suppose, Dogozo, and this is why for me, I keep asking the question to say, explain it to me until I understand it. Um, as if you were talking to an 18-year-old. And the reason I make that particular request is because if you think about who the voters are, these are the people who are supposed to give you the mandate. But if you are not able to engage them and explain to them, then that's why they don't show up to vote. You know, people don't show up to vote not because we're not explaining. People are not showing up to vote because they're just simply tired of the status quo which has been happening in this country. And we are honestly calling on them to make sure that next year they come up in their numbers and they go Sorry, and Sorry, you're going to have to say that again for me because I was distracted by something falling behind me. <laughs> Sorry, folks. It's falling apart. I thought it was we're, falling we, on me. We, we lost our internet now. <laughs> Things are falling on falling I know, on really Doggos, I promise you, next time we'll have a much, well, no, much nicer welcome. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, really, it's like there are people who don't want us to be here the way things are happening. <laughs> Well, trust me, I want you to be here. We so, want you to God, be here. Answer Pumi's question, though, about the 18-year-old. Why people aren't going to vote? Because that is an important question that all of you must have thought about. I, no, we have, actually. Um, when yeah. you look at the last election, the voter turnout was a concerning, I think, across all political parties. We were concerned about the lower voter turnout. Because in the end of the day, if people don't come out and vote, they're going to lose trust in the system itself. And if people can <clears> lose the system of saying, if I vote, change will come. If people can lose that, we'll then might have to face an unled revolution, which is the most dangerous thing that any country can face. So it is, I think people have just lost hope because young people are not getting jobs. I mean, yeah. I mean, you all know what we're right. faced with. You know, they, you go to a hospital, you, you will yeah. stay there the whole day. You might not even get anything except Panado. You might not get the help you need. Education is in Titus. You know, everything is just literally very bad. And I think maybe our people no longer have hope. And that is why in the EFF we're saying 2024 is our 1994. If we are not going to do what our parents did in 1994, mm. we might find ourselves in a hole that we might be, it might be very difficult for the country to get out of. I mean, we're owing everybody. <laughs> you know, the 19, I'm so glad you brought it up. The 2024 is our 1994. <clears throat> Firstly, because the first time I heard that slogan was with Rai Zanzi. And so I wondered if this is a conversation you are having with them. Because when they launched, that was their big launch slogan, right? And so I wondered if you are having the conversation with them, and that's why you now have the same slogan. No, no, they took it from us. We're not having any conversation with anybody. They can rise wherever they want. We don't have. So why are you using their slogan? <laughs> but anyway, no, they took it but from us. That's fine. <laughs> because you know, it is. I mean, next year is going to be a biggest decider, and that's why you can see panic everywhere. Uh, other political parties panicking because. It is now clear that the ANC is going to decline. It's a matter now of making sure that um, people go out and vote. And they, we need to go back and teach our people that their vote is important. And I understand. I mean, for 30 years, you've been voting and nothing changes. You still live in the same mm. poverty sector that your parents were living under. So it is critical for people to understand how important their votes are. And then a, a vote can bring a change. I mean, the... South Africa does not start and end with the ANC. There are options in this country. And then they must go and just make sure that they vote correctly and they vote for the organization that is going to push South Africa forward. So you, you raise the fact that you think that the reason people don't show up to vote is because they are losing hope. Mm -hmm. And given all of that you have told us now, do you think any of that gives hope? Because as I'm sitting here, having been listening to you, I'm more confused you know, than EFF, before. But EFF, do you think it gives hope? Do EFF, you think that messaging 
you know, it's EFF a hopeful message. Does give hope to the people. I mean, since we came into existence, we have changed a lot. Um, I mean, we've also raised a lot of issues as well. I mean, the issue of um, education, the issue of, you know, land, the issue of either you agree with it or not, the fact is that people in South Africa are speaking about it. People are talking about it. The issue of free education, people are talking about it. The importance of a quality education, not just education, because that's another thing we're suffering from where everybody will just take kids to university, but they don't study for the skills which yeah. are necessary. And then they, they, they end up getting out of university and can't get a job can't get a job. So all <clears throat> these things that we speak about, the free quality uh, health care, is all the things that, you know, it gives hope tomorrow. We have medical aid. But, you know, you, your life, you may not even understand what happens when you go to a government hospital or where you go to a clinic where you go there, you stay for hours and you don't even get a proper check. You don't understand people who have passed away, like the incident that we've had when an ambulance have left a person on the side because the but paramedics these are did not, not want to go up These the are stairs. not new conversations. Mm. The conversation of land, for instance, was a PAC policy with Robert Sobukwe, who has long since died. So this is not a new conversation that you have added to the discourse no, of it, South Africa. Actually, it is because I think a oh. lot of... A lot of uh, no, it's, hear Robert me Sobukwe wasn't no, talking no, no. about hear, that. Hear me correctly. Okay. What EFF has done there have been issues in this country. And some of those issues, people may have talked about it, but a spotlight have never been shined on them. You know, a, a spotlight has never honestly been shined on them. I mean, Alex has been there for how many years? For crying out loud. And, you know, a lot of people may not, they are fine, they're okay with it to say, I'm staying in Sentin and there's an Alex like, what is the solution? No one, people were never speaking about such issues. What is the solution to Alex? How this do we house our people? Because people have been, I think of, I mean, they were banned books talking about the issue of Alexander. So this is not a new issue. And artworks. <laughs> there are artworks it's, all over but, the world. But so, we have put it, but what we have shined a serious asking, light on it as the EFF. You, you may think you have. And incorrectly so, because these conversations are conversations that have been happening even with our grandparents. And that's okay. My question, though, has not been answered around whether you feel this message that for us, at least in the room, we have talked about now for almost an hour. If it does the job of giving the hope that you think is what will make South Africans come and vote. We give hope to South Africans. And I think judging by the growth of the EFF, when others have died out, we have grew. So do we give hope? I guess the people have said it. <laughs> so I guess the, the full Amanda. circle then. Um, we are which, giving hope to the people. And that is why today we're celebrating 10 years. The full circle date, which is where we started this conversation, which may have sounded at the time like it was a, a flippant question. But it's for me a very serious question. When Julius Malema calls a press conference and says to everybody gathered and everybody that sees the message thereafter, there was a directive given to the leaders of this organization to organize round number 3,000 buses filled with the people who are their constituents. And they have only confirmed a third of that number. And I will hold them accountable by naming and shaming those people. And here we are two weeks later, and you're not willing to name and shame people who have not <laughs> been not able for me. She, who have she, not been able not a spokesperson to of the meet <laughs> a commitment <laughs> Oops, to the not. party. So they were unable to meet a commitment set by the leader of their party to their party. How can we believe that they will be able to meet a commitment that they are setting for the country? when they can't be accountable I see. And hold to that commitment oh, for their I own party. I see the angle you're going with. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe let's put it this way. Number one, maybe let me correct this. It is the organization that gives a directive. So the organization gave a directive to 
uh, members of parliament, councillors, members of the legislature, that they must be able to bring um, their people, their constituencies to the celebration. Because obviously we want to fill up FNB inside and out, you know. Yes, others may, uh, many have complied and others may have not. And um, it may be certain things, we'll talk about it in War Council when we get the final report of those who did not comply. And probably they'll be asked to explain why they didn't comply. Obviously a bus from Cape Town, you can imagine how much is it does it cost compared well, to a person who's in Johannesburg? So. Maybe Pumi, maybe just because we're running out of time on this, I want I want don't want Jamie to have wasted his morning just coming to argue with me about land. So maybe <laughs> oh, maybe Jamie will well, we come can, and argue with you about anything. That's why no, we're thrilled to have it. Um, but but Dogos, I think maybe then it's fair for us to ask that you should maybe ask the CIC to stand by his word and to report back to us on who these bad people are in the organization and maybe fire them. So I mean, maybe you he could just said ask they it. would be held accountable. <laughs> I hope he yes. finds them. I mean, we do I mean, hold each other him. accountable in the Will you just ask place. him for I mean, us? That's what just... makes us who we are. I mean, we don't play inside the organization. Just tell me what on this show and these people, these irritating people are asking you these uh, really where's annoying the list? questions. <laughs> yeah, where's the, where, where <laughs> demand the list? I don't ask everything <laughs> that you guys can ask for. You are busy asking for the list. You don't even want to... We want the list. You're not even asking for VIP tickets. You're no. not even asking uh -uh. for tickets to the FMB uh -uh. stadium. Uh -uh. You don't even want to go to uh -uh. Uncle's Tom and uh -uh. go and see our exhibition that has been no. running since the 7th I until am, the 24th. I am going to, to let Jamie have the closing word on this, but I am pleased you're here. You are always welcome here. So is Julius. So is Floyd. So is Buiseni. So is everybody, right? Mm. First time we've met. Mm. Um, we'll probably have many more conversations. I think that the EFF has got a number of problems. Pumi sketched a few of those uh, problems. Jamie said that things are looking sunny for you because many people care about the things that you care about as a party. Um, but let's keep talking because we're not going to get anywhere in this country. And that's why I do appreciate the fact that among all the things that he and I disagree about, your CIC says we've got to talk to each other. Yes. The parties must talk to each other. There's mm -hmm. no one you can't make a, a concession to. There's no one you can't compromise with. Otherwise, you don't have a, a country. You've that's just got a bunch politics. of people who hate each other. And that's stupid. So, uh, Jamie, you get the closing word. Okay, pressure. Um, so, I, I think that the EFF is going to grow um, in the next election. I do think that they do have a message that does resonate with a few people. Um, and maybe that ceiling is 15% or whatever the number may be. Um, but on, the, on, on, on top of that, I do think that the opposition parties are underestimating uh, 2024 because of the current polling that's coming out. You know, there's a book I read in high school called I'll Marry When I Want by Ngugi Wationgo. Mm -hmm. And in the end of that story, the old man wins. And Turkey is another example of how the old man can win. And I think the DA, the EFF, and a lot of people who are trying to uh, stake, um, you know, land on, on the chessboard, so to speak, are underestimating the power of incumbency and the collective experience of a political party, which has been in existence for over 100 years. And if we are going to see a new government next year, these opposition parties will have to work a lot harder and will have to maybe do even what you're doing, talk with a little bit more good faith and goodwill to each other to actually do what Mpumi is suggesting, uh, encourage young people to get interested in the next election, because it won't be 1994 if most of the population feels like it's a waste of time and everyone is squabbling. Yeah. And the less of a mandate we give to any of these parties, I mean, it was, it was what decided by about 11 million voters last time around. That's, mm -hmm. that's not 18 even 18 million, but that that's such a tiny proportion of the total population of this country. You're telling me that the vast majority of South Africans have just given up. That's a very scary thought. It is very scary thought for everyone involved, the politicians and the rest of us. Okay, I'm afraid we're going to have to call this party to an end. But your party still continues. <laughs> yes, we are continuing on the 29th of July. Please, everybody must come and join us. In there the are, believe it or not, there are going to be EFF supporters in our audience who will come. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Togoza. Thank you, Jamie. Thank Pleasure. you, Pumelele. We will see everybody again next week for the same thing in the Burning Platform. And uh, I really uh, appreciate the fact that there were so many comments that we can get to. I'm sorry, guys. We will put those comments to the next EFF person who comes to speak to us, if it isn't Dolgozo. <laughs> All right. And uh, have a good day. We'll see you tomorrow at 6 a.m.